place that we live in over there is, is called Bori Raw House. It was a one of those small summer resorts in Muskoka. There were many of them in those days. They all seemed to have red roofs, you know. They're <laughs> winter here house and they're painted white. And this boat was used to ferry the guests because the the steamers wouldn't go all the way down to Arthur Lee Bay over here. It was too far and there wouldn't be enough people. So the reason that the boat has the name of the resort on it was that people were told to get off the Sagamo or whatever it was and look around on the docks till they see a boat that has the name. And that was the thing. So this was the boat that was used to bring people. It would always come through the cut, you know, the canoe cut, or cut, it's really. And it would bring people through there. And I have photographs of it in the 1920s loaded up in the bow with bags of flour and God knows what all stuff, you know. It, and my aunt owned the boat and I don't know what she paid for, probably about $575 I think was about the going rate in those days, but it's the it's the deluxe model and it uh, you can put 18 people in them according to the picture, you know. <laughs> yeah, but you, you can put a lot and I remember as a boy when she was a very old lady, um, she would take us once a year on a good run. We'd go down Lake Muskoka, we might go to Bala, or we'd go down, say, to Bomaris. There were all kinds of places where you could have a shore lunch in those days, and that was wonderful. And I remember I was a guy, because I was about 10 or 11 years old, I always had to take the front seat out and bail the boat because by this time it was getting pretty leaky and old, you see. And my brother and I were, were instructed to kneel on the front seat and watch out for rocks. So I, that's how you keep the kids occupied, you know, so they've got a job to do. And, and I also had to put the gas in the tank and I had to put in the gas. I still have the jar. It was, a, it was one of those uh, sort of a vinegar jar you know, one gallon jar, and I still use that. And it's handy because it's glass, and you pour the gas on it, and if there's any water in the gas, you can see it before you dump it in the gas tank. So I still use that, you know. And we'd strain gas through an old felt hat. So we'd go and have this lunch. We'd have the whole boat filled with aunts and uncles, and all the wicker hampers full of uh, goodies, and we'd have a, a really nice lunch. And then about mid-afternoon, everybody decides, day like the day, you know, decide it's time to come home. So we'd, we'd start coming home, and you'd get about to the mouth of the Indian River, the south end, and the engine would start running slightly unevenly. And, you know, the kind of the exuberant mood would kind of change, because <laughs> they were kind of clouds on the horizon which usually did appear after a little while and I remember going on these trips year after year and I don't ever remember one trip where we actually made it all the way home without somebody having to row the last half mile or something and, and I remember my aunt would look very worried and she'd fiddle with the controls and sometimes that helped and sometimes it didn't but you know, there's probably batteries going dead, you know, just slowly and things like that. So I, do, I fell in love with the boat when I was a kid. I used to sit in, in the boathouse and just watch it for hours. I, the noise of the rudder squeaking away. And, and there are a lot of, there's a lot of damage on this side of the boat from nails that used to hold tires onto a dock. The tires all fell off, but the heads of the nails were still there. So along about the middle of the boat on this side, there's an awful lot of little bash marks from the nails, you know. But I was a little kid, and I, I thought that was the way it was supposed to be. You, 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 know, you don't realize those things when you're young, you know. So anyway, I've had to live with, you know, trying to prevent them from getting any worse. And there are cracks along here. That's from the years when there was no boathouse and the boat had to be kept turned over upside down on a rock so you'd roll it over in the gunnel and the 
that would crack the plank there and so on. But uh, these floorboards are not the originals. They were put in about 1930 by the Port Carling Boat Works. So somebody smartened up and realized, well, Dippy's all leak. Therefore, you have to have your floorboards raised up a little bit. You'll see that there's a little bit of water in the bilge now. And that's all correct. Well, this boat was so bad and so derelict, it was, it was gray. I mean, there was no color, no varnish left on it at all. The idea was to tow this boat out after we got Pinafore going. And it's an earlier boat. It's like page on and start. So we put a lot of rocks in this boat, took the engine. Everybody saves the engine, you know, because it's pretty. And we watched it going down. And Nora and I were there in Pinafore, and this thing was getting lower and lower in the water. And I thought, you know, this is my family history. I can't let this happen. So we threw all the rocks out of the boat and towed the thing back to shore. And by that time, it was getting up close to the gunnels. <laughs> and so that's when I decided I had to restore this because it was the family boat. And it wasn't the same as the other one. And you know, the difference was. But one thing that was interesting, Hurricane Hazel hit Muskoka in, uh, October 15th, 1954. And it, it, it was a lot of winds and so on. It, it tore open the door of the boathouse that this was in. And the boat got away and it vanished. And my aunt went out the next day and she went all around the shore to try to find everything that had floated out of the boat. So she got the oars and nearly all of the seats, the front seat back still original. The seat bottom is not because there were probably tools in it and it probably, you know, sank or something, but it wasn't in the boat. The boat was at the bottom of Lake Rosso all winter. Nobody knew where it was. Stan Carr was out canoeing in the spring, paddling along the out in front of Gibson's place, and which is about, you know, a tenth of a mile from our boathouse. And he looks over and there it is. It's down there. It's in 20 feet of water. <laughs> so they somehow got hooks under the thing and brought it up. And they had to change the, drain the water out of the engine, of course, and get some new coil and new battery and new gas. And away it went. So, But that was probably the reason why all the varnish came off, because it spent the entire winter at the bottom of the lake. So, so it's never missed a year on the lakes. It's always been running every year. So that's kind of a fun story. Baysong is a 1920 disappearing propeller boat, so it's uh, one of the earliest uh, that's still going in the fleet. She's new to me. She was uh, discovered in a, under a cottage on Georgian Bay by John and Happy Thompson in the 80s and restored and uh, run by them for a number of years and I was uh, lucky enough to become her custodian when they decided it was time to sell it. But Dispros, when they first started and until 1922, hadn't figured out any way to control engine from the helm seat, which is this seat to just the rear of the middle of the boat. If you want to start the engine, if you want to stop the engine, slow it down or adjust the carburetor, you had to lean over this seat or climb into the front compartment in order to do it. So it requires a certain agility and a certain uh, familiarity with the motors so that you don't put your fingers in the wrong place. One of the features of this boat is the top. They discovered it by serendipity when they were looking for other Dispro parts. It's the only original Dispro auto top left in existence as far as we know. They were advertised in the catalog for two or three years, but they added half as much again to the price of the boat as the total price, so they obviously weren't very popular. Uh, and I find, I'm very glad I've got it because it just is a wonderful air conditioning unit. It keeps the sun off you, and it also funnels the air through in sort of a pitot tube effect. So you've got, on a hot day, a lovely breeze blowing over you all of the time. The motor is a Model D, which is one of the uh, earlier Dispro motors. It's been very reliable, but uh, 
it has to run well because you have to lean over the back of the front seat or climb into the front seat and flip the flywheel in order to start. It's not running well, there's not much margin for error. The improvements that were made, the rudder is uh, not as deep as the rudder on the later boats, so that if somebody's sitting in the front seat, and uh, then you, the rudder comes up out of the water and it's rather difficult to steer. The other thing, uh, device, which is the heart of the disappearing propeller boat, it's the, the unit into which the propeller will raise, either if a rock hits the skeg in front of it or if you lift the lever. This one is held up just by a ratchet, which obviously, or not obviously, but always is too loose or else too tight. The later boats, they put a, a brake on it so that it worked better. The name that John and Happy uh, put on the boat, Beisong, is the, uh, the first part of the Ojibwe name for Port Carling. Uh, Beisong Rapids, uh, with, with the rapids where the locks are now, the small locks. Gladys is a 1947 Brevet 50. After the original company went bankrupt in 1926, the patents and the patterns were bought by someone in Lindsay who built a few boats, and then Brevet uh, purchased the patterns and built the boats until about the mid 50s. So, as I said, this is a 1947 model built by Brevet. It was found by Doug Brown in about 1984, stored by him, and has been a member of the uh, Dispro Owners Association since its inception. I purchased a boat from Ann Brown last Christmas. And the idea was to see if uh, Dispro would uh, lend itself to repowering from gasoline engines, which are fun, but a little bit cranky and hard to operate, to electricity, which is uh, dead simple to operate. Credit for the idea has to be given to Kerry Harmon, who is an engineer by profession and who did a lot of work collecting the information on a number of boats, not exactly dippies, but dippy light boats that had been electrified and producing the criteria or the appropriate durance for the boat. The idea was that she should be able to keep up with the Dispro fleet, which goes about six or six and a half miles an hour, and she should be able to do that for a minimum of five hours. Using Carrie's numbers, we took out the St. Lawrence engine and put in this package, the motor, the controller, and the drive are all a package produced by the electric yacht company in Minnesota primarily for sailboats. This motor can be configured to run on uh, 24, 36 or 48 volts and will produce power in accordance with that. We chose the 36 volt arrangement and so the power is in these two batteries. They're each 100 amp hour 36 volt batteries. They're wired in parallel so that gives you the equivalent of a 200 amp hour 36 volt battery. Carrie's numbers said that going at six or six and a half miles an hour, we should be able to go for five hours. What we've uh, proven is that we're getting more closer to six or seven hours. And if you're prepared to uh, drop the speed half a mile an hour to five and a half, you can go for eight or nine hours. Installation has been a very successful one. It's smooth, it's quiet. As Paul Doddington said when he came out in it, you can hear the birds singing when it's going. We think that perhaps there's a uh, future, not, all, not for all the dippies, but for those people who find the engines a challenge. This seems like a good solution that will keep the boats going and uh, allow tremendous ease of operation. And you don't get your hands greasy.
dashboard controls all in, and that's 1922 when they did that. So in up to, up to about 1922, you had to hand start them. But starting right. in 22, it was standard to have have this setup, where your grease cups are here and there are lines going to the main bearings, and uh, this allows you to operate the priming cup. So if you want to, you can actually make it breathe, or you can prime it. You can open it. That's that's an open priming cup, and this is the automatic prime position where you use a little piston pump here to shoot gas through that line into the cylinder, and then when you want to go, you push that forward and. That locks into place and keeps the, closes the thing off. Um, so the starter is, is really ingenious. It's down in here. And uh, it's a little ratchet mechanism. And uh, so it turns the whole propeller shaft, propeller, and everything. So when you're pulling on that, you're revolving everything that there is to revolve. Pull this out, you'll hear the ratchet. That's what you don't want to happen if we're in just running it whatever. This is the carburetor mixture again. Speed it up. We do it that way. Well, I've got the propeller up right now, so I won't speed it up too much. How you change the spark timer. Check that the water pump is working. You can do that. So this is just running off a couple of uh, Duracell batteries that you can't get anymore, but that's their dad out. Have you ever 
see one with a foot starter? Uh, just pictures, and I've seen parts of the foot treadle mechanism. Imagine that launched a few people, because you had to stand up to do it. Yeah. And it would be like Kickstarter on a motorcycle. The one thing that I really liked about these was that they mixed your control rod here for the carburetor. It works kind of like a choke. And normally when you pull a choke out, that's rich. You know, like, but on this thing, it's hooked up the other way around. <laughs> so when you want to start it, you run it rich, you push, the, push it in. And once you're going, Everything's warmed up. You pull it all the way out. Dad was running one of his dippies one time, and the pin, dry pin on the flywheel, oh, fell out. Key? Yeah. And the flywheel ran up the side of the boat, went overboard. Yeah. <laughs> you know about that, don't yeah. you? Tom? Oh, I didn't lose the flywheel. No, you I, didn't. I had somebody sitting in the front seat. She suddenly went. Ah! Come out and hit her in the foot. She was barefoot. Yeah. <laughs> then the engine quit. Right? Then the engine quit. Yeah. This is the Model E engine, and I guess what they did when they designed, or when they were talking about different models, the very first model engine in 1916 was a Waterman, two horsepower Waterman, that was virtually the same as the one that Tom's boat. And, but the first war was on, and of course it was very patriotic fervor and all that sort of thing. Made in Canada was important in those days. So they got the A.D. Fisher Engine Company in Toronto to build the uh, copy. Not nearly as good an engine. Uh, very roughly machined. And, uh, they, they worked and uh, apparently Mr. Uh, Fisher had a cottage on Lake of Bays and he had a four-cylinder one over there, but I've never seen it. So there were two models of that. There was a two and a half, a two and a two and a half horsepower. So that would be the the B and the C. And the, there's no difference between them. I don't know how they gained a half a horsepower in one year, because the parts all fit. And then finally, when the disappearing propeller boat company immediately after the first war was getting big and they were expanding, they decided that they wanted to have their own moniker on the engines. So they they put out an engine called the Silent Dispro. And that's because the earlier engines had these cast aluminum mufflers and you could hear them for miles. They were the loudest thing around. And I think particularly here in Muskoka the people really objected to the racket that these things made. Terribly noisy engines. So they started using uh, mufflers that they got from the U.S. Wilcox Crittenden made, made them. The, the other big difference that they did, and they were, these were all subtle improvements, but flywheels did come off engines and people got hurt. And so this flywheel has a nut on the front end and it has a tapered shaft like an outboard motor with an acorn nut on the end. And that acorn nut is a beautiful setup because if you want to remove the flywheel to get at the timer, which you have to get at a lot, you just unscrew the nut about one or one and a half turns. Pull the flywheel forward and give it a bang with a hammer and the flywheel comes off. It's that easy. And there's a woodruff key in there to hold it on. So um, that was a great improvement because the other ones with that other key, sometimes you can never get the key out. And if you need to replace the front main bearing or something, it's some, something that you think, oh dear, and you pray and all that sort of thing, that you don't wreck the engine. Especially having having all the controls for timing. You can see how much advance there is there. It's huge. You know? See there's it's probably over 45 degrees of advance on that. And that's because they're using vibrator coils uh, which have kind of a slow response rate, so you had to keep advancing it exponentially the faster you went. So there was an upper limit to how fast they would go.
people he'd start the engine first and then they'd all pile in because yeah. of course the exhaust was on the water so you yeah. get the heater then, yeah you had the you had the positive pressure on the exhaust <laughs> yeah. when, when we reenacted the picture of 18 men in a dispro we used goggles dimmy and the trick was you had to keep the engine running pretty fast because if you if the engine ever stopped that muffler would fill up with water, you see, and stop the engine. And then the boat would sink. So, <laughs> but the problem was that there were so many people in the boat that somebody bunted the handle and the propeller went down and the boat took off with all these people in there. So we <laughs> it was about as far as from here, oh, I guess to the next point or longer, twice that far, to a dock to the east of Pineland's Lodge. And so we made everybody stay perfectly still and say, we're just going to aim it for that. And I was the guy that was running the engine. I was up in there and I had to figure out with all this massive weight, you know, 3,000 pounds in this boat, when to shut the engine off. Because I knew that once I did that, because he couldn't get the propeller back up. And we were coming in, we are making a starboard landing, which was no good, because the boat would walk to the port, you see. So it ended up where we had to let, let the boat engine fill up with water, but we got, brought it over the dock, and people got out. And Bert Hurst was sitting on the bow of that boat, and he's the guy in the picture, right. 1920, that is, uh, is in the boat and he's sitting in the same place in the bow in the second picture. So he's the only one of the original guys who, who did the picture twice. And he was the smallest. Yeah. And that's yeah. Said the <laughs> people that era, when you took that picture, they were a lot bigger than the ones that were in the original picture. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, because they were all in the first war they didn't get much to eat you know? <laughs> and of course they worked hard one of the things they had to do at the factory was in the winter time to try to start the electric motor they'd all have to grab onto the belt and run across the room because it was a belt drive you know sort of like Duke's was you know This piece of half round here is the only piece of wood that I could find that survived the Sagamo fire. That's from Sagamo. It's just a, you know where the gangway is where you go in the side of the boat. It was up along the top and I hunted around on the ice the day after the fire and that was the only piece of wood that I could find. It's partially burnt but it fell off and fell into the lake it fell on the snow and I guess that put the fire out so that's about all there is left of that thing. <laughs>